Okay, it is 9.02. Um, welcome everyone. We have a, like I said, a very big group. More people keep on coming in as we speak. Um, but unfortunately we do need to get started as much as I'm having fun saying hi to all of you. Welcome to um, Adventures at the Low End. Low frequency optimization in studio, Chris, the, in studio critical listening rooms, behavior research tools, and okay, I'm not even sure I know exactly what that is. Um, that seems to be above my pay grade, that's for sure. But I do know someone who knows a little about this. Um, I believe it is our host for the day. Um, and that would be Mr. John Storick, the founding partner, director of design for WSDG. Um, He's guys done a few things, um, registered architect, um, 3,500 world-class projects, designed a couple projects for some people that I don't recognize. Um, he's an educator. Um, yeah, he's been around a little bit. Um, I think hopefully if you haven't heard of him, um, you might not be in this uh, webinar. So without further ado, I would love to introduce um, your host for the day, Mr. John Storek. John, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Justin. You've and, done a few uh, things. You've, you've, you've. I, 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 hadn't heard of you, so, uh, I'm just a, and and I haven't heard of many of these people that you've done projects for. So, uh, welcome. Let's, let's get busy. It just means I'm old. That's all. <laughs> um, and uh, full disclosure, Justin is on the West Coast, so that's why he thinks this is a 9:30 in the morning. Oh, that's right. <laughs> on the East Coast, where I am. It's 12:30, and I have no idea what time it is for everybody else. We're up, at, we're up, approaching almost 250 people. It is way beyond our expectation. We thought we'd get 70 or 80 people interested in this subject, um, but it looks like we might have hit a root canal. Um, uh, and it, it maybe this is a sort of a silver lining for this C19 era that we're in. Um, as a person and as a company, we've. I'm always looking for, you know, what, what's the silver lining in all of this? And obviously we're all at home for the last six months and we're all musicians. We all want to make music. We need music. And a lot of us are working in home studios, project studios, small rooms. And um, we're going to explore some, some, some situations that take place in relatively small rooms. Um, Adventures at the low end was how we got you how we got everybody interested in coming to this, but all those words below it are really what we're gonna talk about. Um, so the way I'm gonna solve this problem is basically by getting three other people to do the work, okay? And I'm, I, it, I, uh, it, it, it's an honor to actually be considered a host um, and introduce uh, Dirk, Peter, and Renato. I'm gonna talk, uh, hold off for one second on that slide. I'm gonna, um, uh, what we're gonna do is, we, there's an order to what, what we're going to discuss here. Um, uh, Dirk uh, uh, will uh, give us a, a sort of an overview on acoustic simulation, a simulation and oralization, so a little bit of a primer on that subject. And we'll end with, um, with a big question mark, okay, which is what happens as we go down in frequency on these small rooms. Peter is going to take a deep dive into this. Fasten your seatbelts for that. We'll talk more about that. Okay. Um, we hope to not lose too many of you when the math comes on, but we'll do the best we can. And then we're going to end with case studies and some real, real world examples and some photos. Um, so that's going to be the job. Each person's going to chat for about 20 or 25 minutes. I'm going to try. There are going to be a lot of questions we will probably get to very few of them and we'll hold the questions towards the end of each of the presentations. I'm gonna be monitoring the questions. If we see one that's just 15 people are asking, we might interrupt, but we do, what we do promise you is we will ingest all the questions, summarize them and produce an answer reply a document within a week. Um, if everybody, anybody wants to watch this presentation again, it'll be on our webpage as was the last two uh, uh, educational webinars that that, that we had. Um, we also have some polls that we like to pop up in the middle. It's kind of fun. Some of them are, uh, are polls on some questions that we're particularly interested in as a company. 
Um, some are directly related to the subject matter. So if you see a poll pop up, it's only going to stay there for about a minute. Try to answer it. If you really don't want to answer it, you could just let it go away. Some of you have probably seen this happen in other Zoom kinds of webinars. Try to answer them. They, they kind of help us to know where we should navigate in the future. Okay, so let's get started. Let me introduce Dirk and we'll throw up a little bit of bio. Um, I couldn't ask for a better trio of of, of uh, partners and friends. Um, Dirk is a student of mine, became an intern, is now a partner of mine, uh, probably was always smarter than me, definitely smarter than me. And um, you can read, I don't have to repeat what's on the screen there, um, and runs uh, WSDG Europe, which now has two offices, one in Basel and one in Berlin. And um, uh, a dear friend for, for over uh, almost 25 years. And um, so with that, we will now hand this over to Dirk. Dirk, good morning. Actually, good good evening for you, I presume, right? Yes. Hello, John. Right. Hey, Kurt. So Dirk, hey, Justin. Hi, hey, everybody else. I'm going to ask everybody the same question. Yeah. Bonjour à la France. Uh, and ik wil eventjes goedemorgen, goedenavond zeggen naar Nederland. Uh, you forgot to mention I also speak some languages. So, uh, but this and is exciting and fun. Where are you right now? Right now, uh, Central European time. It's uh, okay. 6.08 in the evening okay. where I am. I'm in the Alps actually on a kind of a long weekend uh, trip and happy to be with you all. If you, if you hear some cowbells in the, in the distance, it's actually real cows. It's not a sound effect I'm <laughs> playing. <It's, laughs> they were right. passing by here just a couple well, of minutes. Well, let's, let's get started. Cool, very good. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let's get started here. Check, check. All right, you should see Perfect. a beautiful slide here. And as John mentioned, I'm going to start off with a couple of minutes on introduction on acoustical simulations, the basics of that, that will help us understand the further uh, developments that Peter's going to talk about and Renato is going to uh, explain more about later. Uh, this is a well-known concert hall that probably everybody has seen or heard about, uh, Elf Philharmonie in Hamburg, Germany. Our Berlin team has been working on this project for the electroacoustics. And I want to use this to show you the original old way how simulations had been done in acoustics. And that is this way. You actually build a physical model of the space in question scale of 1 to 10 or 1 to 20, which is huge. It takes a, a, a large room to put this in. And you do measurements and you record measurements in this, in this built hall, in this model hall, and you scale uh, down the measurement frequency and you can actually learn things like frequency, uh, like uh, reflections, echograms, things like that from this physical model. This is, as you can easily understand, extremely complex to do this because you have to build this whole thing like an architectural model. And uh, if you want to change something like an angle or a geometry or a material or positions or, an, or the, the, the seating uh, arrangement, you have to rebuild this entire model, which is taking a couple of days and then you take another measurement and then, oh no, this was not good. So let's do it this all again. Another uh, couple of days are wasted. So this is not very efficient. And in, in reality, this is not done for many projects, just really big and long-term projects with huge budgets and uh, other capabilities. So what is done? We are working on, on uh, mathematical models. We use computer simulation software, different kinds. Uh, this is a picture from Ease, uh, from a church. And the mathematical model means that you build a model inside the computer using a point-based uh, approach. approach. You then connect the points uh, building planes and you connect the planes to actual surfaces as you see, see here. You can use this to also do some architectural visualizations if you want to do that. This also helps us to study visibility to a stage or other aspects uh, uh, of a project. So the basic functionality of this type of simulation, I want to explain that quickly to you because again, this helps us to understand uh, Peter's approach later on. We have uh, two elements here that you see. Uh, one is a source, the sound source, which is emitting sound. And this, it's the, the receiver, or the, the green at the bottom right. What we have here is the, obviously, if we 
if we produce a sound at the source, like an impulse, we have the direct path, which is a direct sound going from the source to the receiver. This is kind of obvious. This is the shortest way because it's the direct connection between the two, two points. But also you see on the left bottom side, this little, um, it's like a plane. This line is like a plane. It's a surface that is reflective. The source, we assume it's not really radiating like a laser pointer, but more like a real source, like a mouth or a loudspeaker. And we have energy hitting the surface somehow here and then going to the receiver also. But the interesting question is, where actually is this point? How can we, how can we in a mathematical model, how can we find this spot where the reflection takes, takes place? And to do that, uh, we, we, are, uh, we employ an algorithm that's called the image source algorithm. And we do the following. You see our original source. This is a real source. And we're going to reflect this. We're going to mirror this on this axis here, like this. And we're going to create a virtual or mirror, mirror source at the other side of that boundary. We all know that this boundary is kind of not really transmitting sound, but we act as for, for now, we do as if it actually would transmit the sound. And we um, treat this as a, a real source. Again, it's a virtual source, but nevertheless, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a source. And we treat this as a source as well. And we also have sound elements from the virtual source that go to the receiver. If we draw this like this, we actually get to this exact spot where the reflection takes place. This is this exact spot. And also the path length is the same from the virtual source to the receiver as from the real source over the surface to the receiver. So the virtual source, this image source algorithm that I just explained here, uh, this is really helping us to, in mathematical models, find those reflection points that are important. One last question in this graph, I'm going to explain this in a second, is this point here, the blue circle here. This is the behavior, what really happens in this circle is a question of what material is this surface made of. It could be like an absorber, so it's actually changing energy from one domain, the sound field, to a different domain like heat or uh, kinetic energy movement. Um, that is happening here. And in the simulation program, we have to define the actual surface, what is there, like gypsum or wood or a chair or a person. And it will change the reflection uh, quantity of energy uh, at, in this point. And while I was talking, something else came up here. I'm going to explain this quickly at the, the, the top right. This is the time uh, diagram of the energy leaving the source. We have the impulse that it's leaving the source at this point here. It's flying through the air and it's receiving, it's arriving at the receiver position in a pretty high uh, energy because that's the shortest and fastest way. It's still a lot, of, a lot of energy there. Then there are some time passing and the second part, the reflection arrives at the listening position, which has, is later in time and also lower in energy. It lost some energy around the, uh, on the way. So this is the explanation of this graph. And something else showed up here, that's this little line here, because in reality, of course, all our simulation models, we do not have just one surface. We have, like, it's a closed room. We have at least six surfaces. So that means that we also have another virtual source at this side of, of this wall. And we have another reflection pass doing something like this, going here and then going to the receiver back. We have to do this for every single surface that we have in the model. If it's a church that I showed you uh, earlier, it could be easily hundreds or thousands of surfaces we have to do this with. So it's a, a lot of data that these simulation programs actually have to deal with. This is a, a slightly more complex situation, but the same algorithm is shown here. We have the source here, the listener here, and you see that we again uh, uh, create a, an image source, the virtual source here, and we have a juke, juke reflection path, but we also have an image source here. We go from this point to this point, and we have a reflection path here on this one. And we also have in this graph, that's a, the, a little confusing with all these lines, we have not just first order reflections, which means we, uh, we, we, we touch one surface, but we also have second order reflections, which are touching two surfaces, like this guy here, check, check, check. And we use the same model, the image source model, to get to the second order, third order, fourth order, et cetera. You can imagine that this, again, uh, with all the surfaces, 
first, second, third, fourth order, etc. We have a lot of data to track, and that is why these simulations they actually do take a lot of time and computational power to perform. In reality, uh, this is uh, a, a, a brief uh, detail. Uh, you see the listener position here with a little circle around it. This is the counting balloon, which means, okay, if the actual reflection does receive the counting balloon, we count it as a real reflection. This can be defined in the program, how big the counting balloon should be. Uh, and this guy, for example, passes the counting balloon is not counted. So a bunch of reflections from this area here is being counted as a real valid reflection. And this guy is not reflected, no, not counted, sorry. All right, what can we learn from these types of simulations? This is uh, Ease, I mentioned Odeon, CAT Acoustic, all these type of, of simulations. We can have single point data that is shown here, like for example, a decay of sound in a certain uh, uh, position in the audience, like a seat uh, row number four, seat uh, 17. We can look at that particular spot and it's a single point uh, data that we study. Like this is all, types of uh, uh, reflections that arrive at this, at this uh, particular position in a theater, for example. We can also do mapping. Uh, we can dis display results in a mapping uh, display. This is a, an, an airport uh, check-in hall, actually. And you see the colors, it looks really nice. And the colors mean uh, distribution of speech intelligibility, uh, for example. We can search for uh, various uh, parameters as you see here but this for example shows where the speech intelligibility is good uh, it's the, the the blue and the dark blue so mainly it, it's it's good we have a couple of spots where it's kind of the green is really good and the yellow is not so good so there are some spots that are not so good but we can see instead of going through all the audience seats one by one by one by one we can look at the entire uh, mapping um, of, of, of the space. That's a really convenient way of displaying results in simulation programs. And most excitingly, we can do something that's called oralization. We can actually listen to the space before we build it. And I'm going to try to replay this file. This is an airport, no, it's a train station where we uh, submitted planning uh, documentation for three different levels of complexity. Uh, with acoustic uh, treatment and with three levels of quality of speech intelligibility, as you will hopefully hear. I'm going to replay this one. People who understand this metric, uh, this is rather low. This is below most standards where speech intelligibility should be located. So this is really not so good. Let's listen to Attention, please. Train approaching the platform. For your safety, stay behind the yellow line. Not that bad, but it's really not super good. Let's jump to this one immediately. This is 0 0.58. Listen to this. Attention, please. Train approaching the platform. For your safety, stay behind the yellow line. And again, the next train towards just to mention Stonehouse. that. Oops, let me stop that. Just to mention that quickly, this is a non, not yet built a train station. We could study this before the train station actually gets built. We can we can uh, give this to the architect and demonstrate this to the architect and ask him what he likes more. But we have one big major problem with this type of simulations and I accidentally already popped it in. Maybe you haven't seen it yet but now it comes okay. This is not applicable for low frequencies. All these nice tools that we have, uh, Ease, CAT, Dion, whatever, they are not applicable for low frequencies because the low frequencies, they have uh, not the image source model as we know it, as I explained it before. We have, we have the capability of displaying, of or, or representing sound by uh, like a ray of light, like a laser ray going through space. And that's only valid, unfortunately, for high and medium frequencies and not for low frequencies. Low frequencies, they are more like a wave-based phenomenon. They are moved through the, 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 the space in an, in, its, in an entirely different kind of pattern. This is like a, a, a bubble that expands, a balloon that's being, being uh, inflated inside the room and not a single arrow that shoots through the room. So very, very unfortunately, we cannot do this for low frequencies. 
So what we're gonna do, we're gonna hear about that soon. But first we wanna stay with low frequencies a little bit longer. I wanna show you some more uh, parameters that are connected to this wave-based effect. For example, the standing wave, the very famous phenomena. We, we can, can illustrate this by a string that we held between the fingers and we resonate this. And you see that certain diagrams of strings can develop in the space. And these are some frequencies shown here. And these are the standing uh, waves, the modal frequencies of this particular space given by the two dots left and right. So this is a, like a length of a room or a width of the room. And we cannot really prevent that. Uh, we cannot really, really uh, do this, um, prevent this, unfortunately. Let me see, now, here we are. We have, uh, fortunately, a, a, a very smart person named Rayleigh. He came up with an equation to be able to, to, to um, make available the list of frequencies where these happen uh, if we enter the dimensions of a, of a room. Uh, we have, uh, this, is, this looks very complicated, but in fact, if we simplify this a little, uh, we can say we're looking at just one dimension in a room for the axial mode and the length, for example. We only take ILM, this is, the, this is a numbering scheme, and the X and the Y and the Z mean the coordinates, the length of the, of the space in X, Y, and Z direction. And let's say we took, take a look at only the X uh, direction, length of the room, and we can eliminate these terms and then the square, uh, the, the square root of the square eliminates them itself as well and we get to a rather simple equation for one axial mode along the length of a space. Uh, if we take a look at that, these are the dominant modes, uh, the, the, the axial modes, the, the simple ones. We also have, if we have two indices, so two terms here, this i and the l for example, not being zero, we have modes that are in a square room, they're kind of going from wall to front wall to side wall to rear wall to like this way. And the uh, most complicated, we actually do have uh, the, mo mo the, the most complex one is where we have all the three indices are not zero. So it's the, the real, the, the full complexity of the equation. That's oblique modes, they go over the three dimensional space. This is in comparison, rather easy to calculate. For example, with this Excel spreadsheet, which I'm gonna show you quickly. This is a tool we've been using for a couple of years now. And you see here on the bottom left, it's a little small, I apologize for that, but I hope you can see it. It's uh, these yellow fields. You can basically enter your room dimensions, length, width, height, and you can see the modal distribution of, of this room in the, the top left graph here. Uh, this is, uh, these modes are, are okay. They'll go to, to level one here. And these modes are really not okay. They, it means like we have two modes at the same frequency and we should really prevent that. That's not a cool thing to have in a room. We should not have a buildup of standing wave frequencies in a room. This one is slightly also goes to one and a half. We have another twos and these are really bad ones, 2.5, 3.0. These, these are, this is not a good room. So the, if, if this is really room dimension, this is not really ideal. Now let me change one dimension slightly, like the length, for example, from 7.5 meter for the uh, non-metric people that uh, the, uh, multiply this by three for foot approximately. So it is a 21 foot, 23 foot uh, room. And we, do, we change this by an 18 foot room, like a six meter leng length room. And you see here, we in the low below 80, we have eliminated those buildups. We still have a little here, but it's uh, for sure, it's much better than the situation before. So the, the goal for modal density distribution is we should try to not stack them on top of each other, those modes. That's really the goal. All right, let's talk about one other uh, very important uh, uh, term that we're gonna use later on again is the Schroeder frequency. The Schroeder frequency basically answers the question, when is a frequency really low? Because 
believe it or not, it depends on the room whether or not a particular frequency is considered to be low or not. The equation is given here. I'm going to give you some samples soon. This is the field of higher frequencies. This is the, this is the actual Schroeder frequency here, blah, 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 the middle zone. And geometric acoustics means that it's okay to use the tools that I introduced at the beginning, these uh, ray-based ray uh, tools. The left side here, the wave acoustics, here we can unfortunately not use those tools. Let's look at a couple of samples. This is a big theater, big room. Uh, if we enter the numbers in the, the equation you just saw, we get a Schroeder frequency of 13.6 hertz. This is really low. There's not much audio happening below it. Actually, it's below the hearing threshold. So no problem of dealing with these reflection-based, um, ray-based tools in, 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 in for, this, for this particular project. In, I, somebody's here from Indonesia, I heard, so uh, good night to Indonesia. <laughs> it's uh, exciting to, to have you here. So maybe you're connected to this project uh, somehow also. It's uh, nice that you're here. And let's look at another room. This, of course, is really much more the reality for probably most people in this call. Um, this is a, a control room with a normal control room volume, normal control room reverb time, and this is 112 hertz shorter frequency, which is, of course, below 100 hertz, that's for some people may say that is even more important than all the rest of the spectrum. So here we really have to be thinking about this, this, this blue line here, this blue, this blue behavior. We, we can really not study this room fully in the frequency spectrum by the traditional tools. It's not, off, not, 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 not an option. So I want to introduce one last effect. It's the SBIR effect. And this is based on a physical property of any loudspeaker that you buy out there or build yourself, doesn't really matter much. We have a radiation pattern that looks like this for low frequencies on every loudspeaker, unless you, re you, you really kind of take care that is different, like a cardioid loudspeaker or something that's spe specifically built for not doing this. But in, in most cases, your regular loudspeaker will be radiating like a sphere for low frequencies. Mid frequencies is kind of gets a little tighter. And for high frequencies, get, this gets a, a, a lot tighter, maybe 80 degree uh, or, or, or a little less even. The problem lies within the low frequencies, as you could have guessed from the title of today's uh, session, obviously. So what's happening here? We are looking at the, forget the text for now, we're looking at the graph here. We have the loudspeaker and a solid wall behind it. And we have obviously the loudspeaker, we, that's why we buy it and why we pay money for it. We want the direct sound, obviously. So while it's producing the direct sound, it also radiates, unfortunately, it radiates energy to the rear side, which is being reflected off the wall. And with a slight delay, because it's a longer path, it actually shows up at the front of the loudspeaker because it bound, it, 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 it uh, diffracts around it. Uh, with some delay. And this is really, really, really bad because we are going to get a, a big comp filter effect uh, if we have this, if we don't take care of this. And this is really not a good situation. There are, three, there are, there are tricks to do to, to reduce this, like putting the speaker all the way back to the wall or even integrating it into the wall, which you will see in professional studios very often because of this particular effect. This is not just that it looks cool, but it actually has a real reason. And there's more bad news because this is a little graph that I borrowed from Peter's presentation. You'll see it later on again. This is our loudspeaker on the stand. And this was the wall here earlier. We, uh, we have another virtual source here because we have a reflection. But you see this, we have ching, ching, ching. Every single boundary creates another virtual source because the graph I just showed you before is actually happening at the top ceiling, at the floor, and at the side wall, and the rear wall, and then even the back wall, and more walls because everything, everything uh, is combined. Uh, the, the listener will actually hear the combined sound of all the real and virtual sources. So this is really not ideal. This is a, a simulated graph, but it's very close to real measurements. Um, of a boundary. Uh, this is the, the gray one is one boundary, two boundaries, three boundaries. It gets a little flatter, but you see it's still a lot of 
uh, decibels that we have a deviation from the ideal, which would be zero if we have no walls or no SBIR effect. Okay, I'm not gonna uh, uh, explain this. So what is the challenge? The challenge is twofold. The challenge is firstly overcoming the limitations of traditional simulation programs because we do not deal with ray-based uh, sound anymore for the low frequencies. We have to go to a wave-based approach in our calculations. The second thing is we have to also simultaneously take care and study the uh, effects that I just men mentioned, the SBIR effect. And that has not so far been successfully uh, in combined in, into one tool, integrated into one tool. But we have some surprises for you today. So I want to get uh, the word back to you, John, to uh, get to the next stage here. Well, all right. OK, but well, don't go away, Dirk. <laughs> no, no, I'm here. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you very much. So. You certainly set the table um, for for the um, for the star of the of our of our presentation, or certainly for the for the for the 500 pound gorilla in the room. Let me ask a bunch of questions have come in. By the way, thank you everybody very much for the poll responses. As you could imagine, those two questions were some subjects that we as a group are extremely interested in. Um, they didn't work directly with this presentation, but we've been asking them having to do with control room and studio configurations. By the way, almost 200 people responded. Thank you very much, because that helps us to try to find out this information. And we'll be, um, well, we shared the results, which were, by the way, very consistent with the last two webinars. So Dirk, there were a few questions. I'm just going to reduce it to two. A bunch of people wanted to know what software we're using, you dropped a few names in, and then of course we have a proprietary one. And of course, the next presentation will be discussing a piece of software we're working on. So Dirk, could you just comment on the software we're using? Yes, absolutely. We're using two tools. Uh, one is Ease, uh, because our partners in uh, our, our team in Berlin is uh, heavily involved with Wolfgang Arnett, which is the developer of the tool. So we're very, very familiar with that one. And we actually prefer it for heavily sound reinforcement based uh, work. If we have a lot of electroacoustics, a lot of loudspeakers, we have really unique capabilities of also uh, studying projects with hundreds uh, of loudspeakers, even if it's line array, con digitally controlled line arrays. But we still, uh, we, 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 we have full disclosure here, we have been uh, distributors for CAD Acoustic for a long time, and we still appreciate and use the tool. Yeah, uh, that are the two tools of choice. Then, uh, uh, well, somebody instantly said, what do you think about Odeon, which we don't use, but you might as well mention yep. it. It's a good tool. Thank I'm you familiar very much, with it. Mark, yep. for asking that question. Yeah, it's a it's a good tool. I I uh, just don't no use no particular reason why you should not use that. Uh, it's it's expensive. Uh, it's it's it was taken over by B and K a while back. Then it suddenly went up in price <laughs> tremendously. Uh, <laughs> it's their business. Uh, I think the answer dealers, I you guess. know you get we get very used to the tools we use. It would be like yep. having an argument over which car is better, Mercedes or BMW. Yep. It's a kind of yep. a silly argument. Odeon has a, a unique advantage that you could do, your, you have your, your simulation within the same tool as you can actually do measurements, uh, yep. which is kind of interesting. You can take Excuse the me. same Odeon, the same platform Quick to your real on, um, The best room ratio possible, and of course we all know that there is no best. Um, is there a best room ratio? I think I know the answer. I, there's no real best one. We, no. with success, we've been using 1.9 to 1.4 to 1, yep. uh, which is one of the Loudon uh, preferred uh, ratios. Uh, there are there are a couple listed on our webpage in the in the technology yep. section. By the way, there's a, like a list of golden ratios. Uh, famous acousticians who kind of came up with. Some yeah, which of those. by the way, it, one of them is not the renaissance golden ratio actually that's not a particular Correct. Good ratio at all yep. as a matter of fact yep. we found Absolutely out true. and then yep. there's a universe of really bad ratios like a cube one to one to one <laughs> yeah, one to one to one would be a yeah. really bad the one. sphere <laughs> that's the worst and the last question and i'm just and then there's a many many more and remember we will answer them all 
And this one comes from Howie Schwartz, who we all know. Thank you, Howie, dear friend of mine and dear friend of all of ours. I will read it word for word. Dirk, explain why it is not good to hear more low end than there actually is in a mix. Good point. And I'm glad to, glad to explain it. Because if you hear more low end in your mix than there's actually present, you will repress it. You will take it down in your mix because otherwise it's too much. And if you play it in the kitchen of your neighbor, which is kind of my worst case scenario, you will actually have no bass left. So exactly. you really want a linear frequency response in your control room. Comes to that, the, the topic of masking, which I'm not going to get into now, but you really want a linear representation in your and control room. Particularly in this era, um, and I just wish I could have my friends Eddie Kramer or, or Jack Antonoff or uh, engineers and producers that we work with where so much work is being done across multiple platforms in multiple rooms. We, we Never before have we been in an era where it's really necessary mm -hmm. um, for rooms to have uh, some standards, particularly at the low end. Anyway, Dirk, I'm going to kick you out, but don't leave. Super. Um, and you can I'll go stay back. on and I'm... Exactly. Um, be let me go right away questions. and introduce uh, our next panelist, and um, I don't like to read the, the work here. Um, this is an honor. Peter is a longtime friend. Everybody on this webinar knows who Peter is. He is the founder of RPG. It's become an iconic uh, three letters in our industry um, and has, in the last few years, dedicated his life to pure research. Longtime associate of WSDG and now um, uh, with the assistance of WSDG and, and other people, uh, is Director of Research for Ready Acoustics, uh, an organization uh, that is completely and solely dedicated to research, uh, tackling some advanced acoustic uh, issues. Our first one is low frequency analysis, which clearly is the bane. It's the 500 pound gorilla in all of our designs, particularly small rooms. Um, he's an iconic person in our field. And um, uh, so, with uh, further ado, what is that ado thing? It's from Shakespeare, right? I think this is good <laughs> business. Anyway, Peter, welcome. Yeah. Start yeah. off by telling us where you are. I know you're on the East Coast, but I'm never quite, I think you're at home, right? Or Washington. I'm actually in my residential lab in the state of Maryland. Okay, great. Well, welcome. And um, everybody, fasten your seatbelts. If you thought Dirks was complicated, it's about to get even a little bit more. Please don't leave, though. Don't leave. <laughs> you got it, Peter. Thank you, John. Well, greetings, everyone. Um, <clears throat> Nero is the first wave-based non-cuboid iterative room optimizer, which we're introducing. Peter, are you sharing your screen? I don't think you're sharing your screen, or I don't see it. I don't know. Uh, you, I think. Thank you, John. Just share it. By the time we're all done with this pandemic, we're going to become Zoom experts. Uh, Should be sharing it now. I don't see it. Still not. Still not. OK, let me start over. Little green button on the bottom. Everybody. And we did rehearse this, too, no less. <laughs> we good? Still not. Ooh, that's not going to be good. No, oh, God. Okay, so we have a backup procedure for that, which is that I guess I could share my screen. Oh, well. uh, Peter, not being able to do it, right? Well, I've done this a million yeah, many times. Many times. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, um, so, Justin, can I share my screen and drive it? Yeah, uh, Peter, just make sure you're selecting the presentation in presentation mode versus just one of your desktops if you have two screens. Otherwise, John will have you share. Sorry about that. Um, we give it a, one or two more minutes. Okay. This is what I typically do. Now, let's try mine, okay? Right? Everybody sees mine? 
Yeah, yep. If you could just go into presenter mode, John, that'd be great. Which I will. No, I thought I was. <clears throat> You're also probably using dual screens. Well, I'm using dual screens, but I'm opening the presentation on my one second. Can't get it to work, right, Peter? Well, it appears to be working from here, but obviously not. Um, um, let's see, I could be wrong. Um, Peter, when you hit share screen, you're given an option of sharing a desktop uh, or the there it is. Here we go. There we go. Here we there go. Guys. Okay, everybody. Great. We're rolling. This is the okay. step. I apologize for that. And if you could just go into slideshow view. Oh. Okay, doc. Swap. And if you could swap present. Yeah, then swap. There we, we go. There we go. Okay, everybody. Hey, We're sorry. Hallelujah. We're passionate about room design and um, we just sold all of our Zoom stock. Okay. <laughs> so, right. anyway, you thank got you it. all thank thank you. For, for your patience. Nero is the first wave based non cuboid iterative room optimizer, which we are introducing today. These images that you see here are actual pressure plots at two modal frequencies and can be thought of as the new acoustical Greek theater masks for comedy and tragedy. Ha -ha. Uh, they illustrate the challenges an optimizer program faces to simultaneously find the best polygonal geometry and positions of speakers and listeners so that they avoid the blue low pressure areas and the high pressure red areas to obtain the flattest response at all modal frequencies. Earlier dimensional ratio approaches to optimize the modal response were based on modal spacing. Uh, like the both amoeba and the criteria by Bonello and Loudon, which uh, Dirk mentioned. These methods are based on the well-known wave equation. So despite the amount of attention this simple approach has been given, sorry to say it is not sufficient for the design of critical listening rooms because it does not consider the location of speakers and listeners. Optimal dimensional ratios are a myth because in real cuboid or non-cuboid rooms, the degree of excitation depends on the positions of the loudspeakers, but the degree of audibility depends on the position of the listeners. RPG's Room Sizer program went beyond modal spacing and iteratively optimized dimensional ratios by minimizing the standard deviation of the modal response. However, the speaker and listener were required to be in opposite diagonal corners. For cuboid rooms, this situation of loudspeaker and listener placement was properly handled in RPG's room optimizer. However, it still did not simultaneously address the room geometry and the positions of speakers and listeners in a polygonal room. Hence the need for a wave-based, non-cuboid, iterative room optimizer, which we call Nero. Nero completes the research that Professor Trevor Cox and I started over two decades ago and provides an iterative optimization program for non-cuboid rooms with the addition of low frequency dampers to optimize the frequency response and temporal decay. This is quite a bit more challenging because we now must account for the actual complex impedance of the room's boundaries and contents. We have to optimize the coordinates of all intersection vertices of the boundary, as well as the coordinates for the speakers and listeners, instead of just determining the optimal length, width, and height dimensional ratios. We have to determine the modal and SBIR response using an, a time-intensive discretized boundary element method with hundreds of boundary elements and high frequency resolution instead of the rapid image model. We have to use a genetic algorithm to iterate hundreds of times due to the large number of variables and possible solutions. <clears throat> we have to insert pressure absorbers into the mesh with known complex impedances, excuse me, to further damp any remaining modes that exceed a specified threshold. <clears throat> this is a shout out to our visitors who are speaking German. Uh, what we're seeing here are the actual modes in a cuboid room. Now to speak about the SBIR, which Dirk alluded to, 
<clears throat> the resulting interference is called the SBIR and presents itself as a dip in the low frequency response. We have a pause for a commercial. But wait, you buy one speaker and you get four virtual speakers free. <laughs> Okay, and Peter, I am going to interrupt because three different people have asked uh, over the same question about how do we deal with reflections behind the loudspeaker. This could be a perfect time to talk about it. <laughs> yes, that is handled uh, in the next here. In Nero, we deal with this automatically and estimate the SBIR at the listening position through the windowing and Fourier transform of the impulse response. So the rear reflections well, all of the uh, uh, nearby reflections occur uh, within about 50 or 60 milliseconds. So by windowing the impulse response and taking the Fourier transform, we can deal with all of the SBIR simultaneously with the uh, room modes, which I'll be talking about in a minute, if that answers the question, John. Good. Now, um, <clears throat> the frequency response is only a part of the equation to achieve a good base response. Our brain integrates the continuous sonic input, meaning that we perceive the temporal decay, which we need to damp for a tight bass response. A proper decay of the room modes is fundamental for a good perception of sonic quality in the low end. Through the application of precisely designed dampers, the frequency response and the decay of the room modes can be controlled without introducing unwanted dips at the wrong frequencies. In small, in small critical listening rooms, the design goal is to provide absorption at specific modal frequencies with a specified bandwidth and maximum absorption to control the modal resonances. Large broadband treatments like so-called bass traps are inefficient and not precise enough. We call these new pressure absorbers acoustical parametric equalizers or apex, analogous to the electronic parametric equalizers. Their placement is also key. Otherwise, we might end up <clears throat> absorbing more frequencies than intended. In the first example shown, the bandwidths of two apex are too wide, leading to an unintended dip at 55 hertz. In the second example, the design frequency is incorrect, leading to a dip at 53 hertz instead of where it is really needed. Breaking news. This new non-cuboid iterative room optimizer program is both a design and a diagnostic tool, which currently contains three modules. The geometry module iteratively optimizes the shape of a polygonal room and the locations of speakers and listeners <clears throat> by minimizing the weighted sum of the modal response and the SBIR in answer to that question, John, using a BEM and a genetic algorithm, which we will explain next. <clears throat> the damper module applies parametric pressure absorbers tuned to frequencies that exceed a threshold in the modal response from a library of apex calculated with the transfer matrix method. The specular reflection module calculates the first and second order reflections in a similar way that uh, Dirk described, arriving at the listening position and the rear wall diffuser to optimize the creation of a reflection-free zone and a diffuse immersive environment, which we'll talk about. The boundary element method is a general wave-based approach which can simulate scattering from any shaped object or behavior within this object by solving the wave equation at any point in the domain. It follows a multi-step process in which first we mesh the shape into small enough elements to represent the wavelength of the highest frequency of interest, generally a sixth or an eighth of that wavelength. Then we have to solve hundreds of simultaneous equations, the Helmholtz-Kirchhoff equations, to determine the pressure on each mesh element, as you see here. These different colors represent the mesh element pressures. Then we plug those values back into the HK equation, and for a given incident pressure, we solve for the pressures at any point in the room using a 3D Green's function as the source. <clears throat> The initial vertices that you see here <clears throat> are, are combined into planes, which are automatically meshed in a program called GMesh, which is shown at the right. 
the geometry module. This module is designed to find the best combination of room geometry, source and listener positions possible, given each room's flexibility. In order to do that, an allowable range for all of the X, Y, and Z coordinates must be defined for the following. This range dictates how much the room boundaries can move and in which directions. This listening range specifies the area in which the listener can vary. The source range specifies the volume within which the sources can vary. This calculation utilizes the complex impedance of the room boundaries in order to account for phase changes, which are not accounted for in the image model. It also relies on a genetic algorithm to perform the room optimization process. Okay, this is kind of the heart of the program. I think, Peter, um, I think it's important at this moment, and I, I know we promised to not interrupt it, that because I'm seeing at least one question, even if you have a room that can't change, and many, many people have rooms that you can't change the dimensions. In other words, when we're designing, we can change a lot of dimensions, okay? Right. But, but if you have a room that's X, Y, Z, it still doesn't mean you don't have geometry options. You have geometric options in speaker placement and listener placement. Okay? That's correct. This is critical. This is super, super critical and could be the, it could be the, the difference between successful low frequency response and non-successful. Well, that, that is really true, John. And that's why I <clears> say <throat> optical room dimensions are a myth because you can have a perfect dimensional ratio, but if your speakers and listeners are in the wrong place, yeah. You're either sitting in a in a black hole or you're sitting on the top of a mine. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then, if the geometry is fixed, you can then vary the, the listener and speaker positions. But you can also add uh, uh, low frequency absorbers, uh, which we which we do all the all the time when when the geometry is fixed. And we'll talk about that yeah. in a minute. But that is a really good that is a really good point because you 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 know many rooms are just fixed. Um, and so, so the challenge, uh, if you think back to those pressure plots that we started with, the challenge is working your way through that minefield to stay away from the black holes and stay away from the mines. And the only way you can do that is to use a, 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 a search engine. And the search engine that we have chosen is called the genetic algorithm. And the genetic algorithm essentially mimics the process of evolution you know, the, the famed survival of the fittest over several generations. And so I'm going to be alluding to this uh, graphic here as I describe the various steps in the genetic algorithm. So we begin with the initialization. This first step is used to create an initial population of N randomly generated candidates whose pseudochromosome consists of genes which are the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the speakers, the listeners, and the room's vertices, as you see here. During each evolution, every, every, iter every evolutionary iteration of ROGA, the BEM is used to evaluate the performance metric. So we have all of these evaluation stages here. Then you get into the selection process. A biased roulette wheel is used to select the candidates for the next step. The wheel is spun n times to maintain the initial number of candidates. The best candidates are automatically sent to the next step, even if not noticed. And candidates that have a higher fitness uh, value have a larger portion on the wheel. <clears throat> so now we get to the fun part. Two random promiscuous strangers meet over drinks in a bar that should really be closed during the pandemic. They have sex and they breed producing an offspring whose genes are determined via a coin torus. We get then to the mutation stage. Each candidate, old or new, has a chance to have one of its genes changed to a new random one, which will keep the population diverse and increase the gene pool. We don't want to have too much inbreeding or we won't get to the appropriate answer. It also <clears throat> is used to remove duplicate candidates before moving to the next generation. Now at this point, um, if we have met the criteria, we can stop and move on to the next process in the optimization. If we don't meet the criteria, we just go to the next generation and we can stop it if we reach a limited, a, a, a specified number of uh, generations. 
as well. Now the fitness metrics that we use corresponds to the weighted sum of the standard deviation and the modal response and the SBIR uh, to, to, to just bring back in mind what, what Dirk was talking about. We're doing both of them simultaneously and we're weighting them depending upon which of them has uh, the more relevance in that particular room. Now it also contains a very important penalty factor to reduce the dips in the frequency response because these dips cannot be later equalized if, when they exceed a threshold. If you have them, you're gonna be stuck with them, which is why you have to go through all of these iterations of the genetic algorithm to avoid those black holes. Now in critical listening spaces, the goal is to generally to achieve the flattest frequency response possible. <clears throat> However, in audiophile listening rooms or home theaters, metrics like the equal loudness contour can also be used to change the total balance of the response. And what you're seeing here is an actual optimization in progress. Every time you see the graph changes, we are going through another iteration in the genetic algorithm. And so in the upper left, you see the worst, the best, and the current spectra. And it's a combination of the modal response and the SBIR. To the right, you see the progress. In other words, we're, we're, we're plotting the fitness versus the generation. And you may have just noticed that the fitness value decreased from the initial position to the next lowest one to the next lowest one. Eventually, we will arrive at the uh, fitness uh, metric that we uh, would like to have. In the lower left, you see, um, in the lower left, you see uh, the room, um, it, well, it has just stopped, but in, in the lower left, you saw the room varying, uh, where you see the geometry is changing and the, the speakers and the listener are all simultaneously moving. Uh, and then on the right, you see the same situation in the section. Uh, and this continues until we, we get a solution that, uh, that we like. Um, now we have a damper module, and this addresses the, the question that John raised. You know, if we have a room, and let's say the speaker and the listeners are even fixed, um, the, only, the only recourse we have <clears throat> is to use a uh, the damper module. And then by using the transfer matrix models, which I'm sorry, I don't have time to describe, we can predict the acoustic impedance of multi-layered acoustic treatments, such as membranes, Helmholtz resonators, and also porous absorbers, uh, which are only applicable in the higher frequencies. Now this enables the creation of fine-tuned acoustic absorbers to treat the resonant frequencies of each different room with precision. <clears throat> From the estimated impedance, we can calculate the absorption coefficient and the acoustic admittance that will allow for precise calculation in the boundary element model. The resonant frequency is first measured with an accelerometer that you see uh, <clears throat> in the uh, lower right of your screen to determine uh, that we have the appropriate resonant frequency. The final impedance is verified in RPG's seven ton impedance tube to ensure accuracy. Here you see the tube uh, with the lid open. It's, it's a seven ton, 24 foot long uh, impedance tube. Uh, here you see the complex impedance, the real and the imaginary part. Imaginary part crosses zero at the resonance. Here you see the reciprocal, which is called the admittance. And then from the impedance, you can calculate the, uh, the absorption coefficient. Now, the amount of absorption needed for each resonance is defined by evaluating the Q factor of each mode and the waterfall plots to ensure the right amount of treatment is added. <clears throat> Specular reflection module, early reflections. By using the image source model that Dirk described, we can trace the origin of the important first and second order specular reflections. Now we're moving above the Schroeder or transition frequency because we have to treat those reflections as well. Um, and uh, what you're seeing are the first order reflections here for simplicity. Uh, this next graph shows these first and second order reflections 
uh, which is uh, obviously more complicated. Now, <clears throat> this will determine if the boundary, if a boundary needs to be reoriented or treated with broadband absorption. Because we have to control these reflections, it's crucial for proper imaging at the mixed position, essentially creating a reflection-free zone, <clears throat> which we introduced three decades ago, which is followed by the diffuse rear wall reflections uh, that you see here. Now, the specular reflection module also addresses diffusion. By analyzing the direct sound that you see here, these are the, these are the speakers and this is the listener. <clears throat> uh, by analyzing the direct sound and the first order rear sidewall and ceiling reflections. So here's a first order sidewall reflection. Here's a first order ceiling reflection. <clears throat> we can determine the size and precise placement of the diffuser to provide ambiance and envelopment, which is very important in a room, that it not be too dead. Because you're introducing signal processing that has to be listened to in a, in a real live room. Now, most DIY diffusers, unfortunately, or conventional QRDs, do not have a necessary diffusion coefficient above 0.5 from 400 <coughs> hertz to 5,000 hertz. For more information, you can see the ISO standard listed here. We must also reduce periodicity, which means placing the same diffuser next to each other, which degrades performance by utilizing modulation with an optimal binary sequence. And this is a presentation all in of itself. A further increase in bandwidth over that of each individual diffuser can be obtained by creating a diffractal, meaning embedding a diffuser within a diffuser, which we are, we are using in several, uh, specified in several rooms. <clears throat> so now, how do we evaluate how accurate these predictions are? We've created a, a ready lab uh, for testing. And it was created using the same boundary construction as is commonly found in control rooms or recording studios, which helps to verify the, com the complex impedance values used for the room's boundaries. You know, these values are not listed in a table. You can't go to the back of a, of a textbook and find the complex impedance values. <clears throat> and so it's really important that they have to be measured and they have to be evaluated in, in actual rooms which is what this lab is, is important uh, to helping us with. Um, so as you can see, the agreement is really, really very good. Once again, a proof of the precision of the boundary element method. Here you see the room with the loudspeaker here in this corner and the, uh, I mean the uh, microphone in this corner and the loudspeaker in this corner and the entry doors. Uh, you see the agreement is, is really, really good. This is the, the, the uh, sub that was used with its roll off and that, that's, that's why we have this difference uh, down in this low end. To, um, to further uh, evaluate the precision or the accuracy, actually, uh, we, we looked at a real, uh, well, before I mention that, in order to evaluate the decay of the room modes, we also compared the reverberation time calculation from prediction and measurement. And as you can see, uh, the fidelity of the method still holds down uh, in the 31.5 uh, <clears throat> hertz band. So then to move on to an actual uh, real project, um, in order to further verify the accuracy of the program and prove the precision of the transfer matrix method, a real project was reverse engineered to serve as a benchmark. At this point, it cannot be assumed that all of the recommendations were fully implemented. So there are some unknowns, but nevertheless, the specified geometry, the speaker listener placement positions rather, and the finishes were used in the model. And the predicted and measured frequency responses are shown below. You know, considering all of the unknowns, this agreement is really pretty excellent. Um, and so uh, with that, I will, uh, I'm sorry, with that, I will end my presentation and thank you all very much uh, for listening, and we can answer any questions that time permits. Great, Peter. Thanks. Apparently, my my video is died. I'm not sure why. We've been trying to fix it during thing, but nobody needs to see me anyway. But I guess we spoken voice. We a number of questions. 
several people wanted to know if this software is available. It is not right now. It's in development. We're not even sure where this is going to go. Uh, we're using it ourselves. Um, we're, we're in beta. There's no two ways about it. Although, as Peter has shown, uh, uh, the results are startlingly accurate. And actually, we've reverse engineered a few projects that we designed using intuition, design, experience, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the results are extraordinary. But more to come on that. But I will ask one that I will allow Peter to comment on. And then we'll zoom on, uh, excuse the pun, to our final presentation. Uh, two different people want to know, how large should the reflection-free zone be? That's a very interesting question. Um, Peter, you could dive in, although Renato might be perfect for that too, but I'll let you dive in on that. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> the reflection-free zone is, is the, the, the length of the reflection-free zone is essentially twice the distance from the listener to the rear wall. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if you convert that distance into time, you know, typically the back wall is, is maybe 10 feet away. Uh, so the reflection-free zone is typically 20 milliseconds. Um, it, it could be longer. It just depends upon the size of the room. And, uh, and it's important to, to uh, decrease the level of those reflections, as you've seen, within that, uh, that reflection-free zone. But it depends on the size of the room. Right. It also depends on how many people you want to sit in the sweet spot. Some rooms could yeah. be a single person room, so you don't need a particularly large one. Other rooms, maybe commercial studios, want to have two or even three people sitting. So it really does depend on the size of the room. And I think uh, Renato would be perfectly ready to jump in on that to possibly discuss that question when we look at some real world examples. So thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Um, okay. And there, uh, there are a number of questions that came in uh, we can keep that up for a second, Justin, and we'll, we'll, we really will get to answer them. And thank you very much for the poll result, too. Um, so our third and final uh, uh, present presenter is uh, another former student, intern, partner, runs our Brazil office, senior acoustician and design partner for our entire global organization, Renato Cipriano. Um, he is a Grammy Award winner, audio mixing engineer, fantastic designer and musician and uh, a great acoustician. Um, and he's got the fun part because he gets to show us some actual real studios. Uh, not all of them, in fact, most of them not having used Niro, but using some other tricks and tools, uh, but pointing out the same results uh, in how we deal with low end uh, information. Um, Renato, I'm gonna hand it over to you. You can start by telling us where you are. <laughs> okay, thank you, John, for the kind introduction. I'm actually here in Belo Horizonte, in my hometown in Brazil, in my mixing room. It couldn't be better home office to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let me hold on, let me just share my screen here. Okay, so let's get going and see how we translate all of those studies into real world examples. But I just wanted to start going back to that concept that, that Dirk and Peter talked about, which is how sound behaves uh, below and above the shredder frequency. We know that there's a lot going on that we need to study, starting with speaker positioning, listener and pressure plots that we can use, and then a whole lot of other stuff that happens above the shredder frequency that you know, would give us at least two or three webinars to talk about. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of architectural and engineering coordination that has to happen. Those things that we've been talking about today is, is just the beginning of the process when we start designing uh, these rooms. And here we have some animations for those people that are not very used to these terms, like wave acoustics. Uh, here you can see a room with two speakers and uh, and this is how you know the low frequency propagates in the room it's it, it's more like thinking of you know bubbles of pressure popping up in in different uh, locations depending on the frequency and as we go up in frequency you see different modes and different uh, points of pressure and cancellations that we have to deal with and as we go higher in frequency it gets to a point where things even out and we don't have to worry about that anymore 
And then we move to the ray tracing analysis, which we can see in this other example here, where you know sound is bouncing everywhere. So at the end of the day, what we need to do is, is to understand how we have to treat these two uh, uh, areas of the low frequency and high frequency so we get the best frequency response. And most importantly, the decay time, which is what really gives you that punchy and, and uh, clean sound in the room. Uh, to the right, you see an example of two rooms that you don't want to be in if you're, if you're recording or mixing. Uh, just because you can easily see that there are some long tails that are probably coming from resonances in the space. So that's exactly what we need to work on so that we can get to rooms that look more like the one in the left that has a much more even uh, decay response in time. Uh, let's look at real examples. And uh, we're gonna start with this uh, very special project we did in China. It's the most pre prestigious conservatory of music in the city of Hangzhou. Pretty large facility uh, for, for uh, orchestra recording and scoring. You can see here how big the room is, very high ceiling. And the reason I'm showing this room is just because the Schroeder frequency is very low. It's uh, around 40 Hertz. And meaning that most of the study that we have to do here, pretty much all of it, it's in a statistical behavior of sound. You see some curtains here that pop out and, and absorb high frequency and a little bit of low frequency. So we get some uh, variable acoustics and we can make it the room uh, more flexible, uh, around 50% change in the mid range. But as we move to smaller rooms, look at this one, for example, it's a studio inside of an Airstream, pretty small. So uh, the problems here are much different. And, and because of the rooms are so small, we have to deal with, uh, especially in this room, with low mid frequencies that were dealt with these panels that you can see on the top left is a micro perforated a panel. It, it's, it's, it's metal mesh pretty much that with some absorption behind and then other kinds of perforated materials inside the room. Here's another example of a very tiny room, actually two rooms uh, that uh, look identical, although they're used in different ways. They're both built in a commercial uh, space. Uh, it's called Mix to Go, it's a studio in Sao Paulo. Uh, one of the rooms is the five one room, as you can see to the right, uh, you can hardly fit two chairs. Uh, going back to the question of, of the sweet spot, imagine how big the sweet spot here is, because if you just move to the left, all you're gonna hear is the left speaker and, and, and that's it. So the sweet spot is pretty small, but we still have a lot to do here in the, especially in the low mids, because in this case, the shredder frequency is around 186 Hertz. This second room is actually an Atmos, a very success, successful studio doing a lot of 3D audio. Although it's pretty small, you can still do a lot of that kind of work. And when you look at the modal distribution of these small spaces, you see a lot of that packing of modes happening in the uh, in higher frequencies like in this case around 150 to 200 hertz so that's where we're gonna focus more of the absorption that we have in this space and i'm not saying that we don't have the problems at the lower end of the spectrum which we still have to deal with but in the case of this room for example which is much bigger our frequency is around 67 hertz and because of the size and the volume of this space, if we don't pay much attention to the low frequency control, we may end up having a very long reverberation time at the low end, which is gonna create a very muddy uh, space. So here's, here's one uh, model that we did for this specific control room using ease. As Dirk mentioned, uh, this kind of programs cannot deal with low frequency. In this case, we were just looking above this range here in the low mids. And if we look at the measurements that were made after the studio was done, 
you can compare them and see that they're pretty close. But what happens at the low end? What happens bef uh, below this, the, the shredded frequency is what we're gonna see in these plots. Uh, these are coming from a different software that now evolved to Nero. Uh, and we expect Nero to be very much more precise than the tools that we were using at the time. But we know that this was a very good guideline for us in order to place the treatments that we have to do in this room. Uh, here, for example, let's look at uh, on the left side at 47 Hertz. From a design point of view, when we see those pressure plots, we can uh, easily start to think about how we're gonna place the absorbers in that room. And you can easily tell that there's, you know, some areas at the front, in the back, you know, in the floor. So why not build a platform here, for example, that has a resonant frequency around 40 to 50 Hertz to take care of that problem that we have, that excessive pressure that is giving, uh, you know, the cancellation at the mix position. Uh, think about sound as pressure in the air. So if you're absorbing the pressure, you are bringing back the cancellations that we have. And we're using the same kind of, of thought in the back to build this platform, different range and taking care of other frequencies. And you can see them here, they're covered with carpet, but behind the carpet, it's a perforated Helmholtz resonator. Above the cloud, there's another space that we can do a lot. If we look at the plots here from 50 Hertz to 100 Hertz, there's a lot of pressure going on in that area. So why not build a very broadband absorber that can take care of much of that and also help us a lot uh, controlling the decay of the room, which is this, curve, this uh, waterfall display here that you see. It's a pretty even distribution. And we, when we plot inside of that limits, we can easily see that, uh, you know, we're uh, right inside of, of uh, this ITU recommendations, which we're gonna talk about more in a few minutes. But uh, from a mixing engineer point of view, I'm much more interested in to see what's going on in the first 30 dB drop. This graph shows the RT60 of the room, but think about the dynamic range of the music that, it's, that we hear. You know, that it's, it's not much higher than this. So when we're studying all of this stuff, we're trying to focus more on, these, uh, on the first 30 dB drop because that that's relates much more to how we hear sound, especially uh, some types of music that has a very a short, very uh, small dynamic range. Here, another example of how we've been treating rooms uh, with pressure absorbers. If we zoom in here, you can easily tell these are perforated Helmholtz resonator calculated for different frequencies based on those, uh, those plots that we've been watching. Uh, same kind of concept, but in this room, you don't really see what they are because they are covered with acoustically transparent fabric. Uh, above this cloud, you see a prefabricated uh, membrane. It's a plate absorber made of a metallic membrane, also uh, efficient at some ranges. In this mastering room at Berkeley, we have a few solutions uh, that we sh I'm gonna show here uh, in three different places. Actually, many, many other places in the room have these uh, high frequency diffusers that are spaced by a small gap, uh, which is enough to create low frequency absor absorption uh, as a Helmholtz resonator. Going back to this room, there are some other effects that we have to pay attention to such as uh, non-resonant interferences, for example, the, the bounces from the console. And we expect that uh, the new softwares that are being developed by Peter and his team to be able to integrate those large elements in the calculations so we can have a better representation. The curve that you see on the left shows uh, the first 
measurement before the calibration took place. You can easily change that using uh, equalization, which is what we did to get to that flat frequency response. But later on, after a lot of listening, you're going to see that uh, a flat response is not really what we want. And I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, here we make a comparison of the prediction and the measurement. And you can see that that range above 100 hertz uh, did not really talk to our predictions. And uh, it, just because it, you know, there's other stuff happening in the room, there are known resonant interferences in this range here. Uh, another interesting project, Church Studios for Paul Epworth, uh, a producer in London, in the UK. A very nice facility that used to be a church in the past. That's how I got the name. The church, you can see on the right side, this is studio where Adele makes uh, all of her recordings in the past. This is a control room. I had the pleasure to be there with Dirk calibrating the system for, for Paul. Uh, here you see uh, the model that we did for this room. In the front, you see the big Augsburger speakers is a three-way system with very large subwoofers, uh, two 18s on each side. You can get pretty loud here. And I'm glad I found this picture from Dirk which shows the readings that we got when we were there with Paul. And as you can see, we're talking about 129 dB dBA uh, as a maximum reading. So- Hey, Renato, that, our, our next webinar will be on loudness. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, so as, as you can imagine, you know, to control a lot of pressure in the low end, there's a lot of work that we have to do. This is a room that has a, a shorter frequency at uh, around 100 Hertz. So we're gonna study what happens uh, below that frequency. And that's gonna come from those plots that we've seen before. And this is just one example of how we have treated one of the frequency ranges. When you look at the front of this room, you see a perforated surface, which is also a Helmholtz resonator. And this is the, 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 the simulated response uh, absorption, sorry, absorption curve for this element. It's a little bit broad. Uh, it, it's not exactly what Peter mentioned that he's using more of a narrow band absorption. But at that time we didn't have the right tools to do this, but nevertheless, it's a very efficient uh, Helmholtz resonator that's also helping a lot with the decay in the space. A brand new studio that just opened a few weeks ago uh, here in, in my hometown in Brazil. Uh, this is uh, a studio called New Doors Vintage Keys. It's called New Doors because it had, it used to be a studio that belonged to a famous band here in Brazil called Skank. And the Vintage Keys comes from this. It, this is a, a, the client is a keyboard player very sophisticated with uh, synthesizer programming, an amazing room that he has for himself upstairs and is also available for clients. And we have this live room with uh, variable acoustics on the walls and, and curtains covering that uh, brick wall in the back. I had the pleasure of uh, working in the opening of the studio a few weeks ago with the band Skank. We were doing this live and coincidentally, we're doing a next one this Saturday. So if anybody on this call wants to hear how this room sounds, just uh, check out the, the Skank uh, website and you're gonna see a link for a, for a live that's gonna happen on Saturday night. This is the control room. This studio is fully analog. You can record on tape and mix on tape without going digital at all, or you can uh, go to Pro Tools if you want. Uh, we have a frequency of 94 Hertz, uh, shredder frequency. So there's a lot to do under, uh, below that frequency in order to control the decay. This is just a parenthesis that I, I would like to show to you. I know there's a lot of people on this call, so I thought it would be interesting 
to share something that I, I didn't know exist. Uh, it's a console that has a, an acoustically transparent surface. It like really transparent, 100% transparent. The, the talkback microphone is right uh, beneath the surface of, of the console. And, and the reason for doing this is, is of course to avoid reflections. So we made a quick test the other day, which was to, to add reflection to the console. You know, it's not a perfect test. We put some vinyls there just to see what would happen with the frequency response at the high, at the high end. And so you can easily see those, those peaks, you know, as con filtering effects. Just a curiosity. Very cool, very cool console. When we look at the model distribution of this room, uh, you can see that they're piling up close to the shredder frequency, around 60 to 80 hertz. And this is a prediction that we had at the time that shows uh, a, a very deep cancellation in that, in that range. Uh, me, as, as a mixing engineer, this is uh, much more of a concern for me when we have these dips uh, than the peaks. But of course, when you see a dip this way, you know that in other places of the room, you have a lot of pressure build up. So at the end of the day, all of this stuff is going to bring the decay. It's going to make the decay to be much longer. So we, we have to pay attention. And as we plot the measurement that I took the other day in this space, you can see that most of that cancellation was gone. And uh, the way we got to that was by placing the absorbers in the right location. Uh, when we see uh, the plots like this one to the right, uh, they're all blue. It means you don't have many opportunities here to place uh, the pressure absorbers in the room. You need a place where we have pressure. But if you look close, you can see that we have some opportunities here at the top, at the front, in all of these ranges. So that's exactly where we place uh, those uh, pressure absorbers, besides adding high frequency absorption too for reflection control. And of course, there's much, uh, many other things happening in the room so that we can control the decay. Uh, here, we are zooming in, in the low frequency range of the spectrum from 20 to 20, 250. And if you, if you take a look at those problematic frequencies, you see that they are pretty well controlled. You know, we have a little bit more time in the 33 Hertz domain, but if we look at the 30 dB drop, you can see that the uh, decay is pretty short. So we have a very, very tight base in, in, in this room. And the last one is a studio we did for J. Cole, who is a hip hop producer, great musician, very interesting setup. We have a control room and a live room at the front and a bigger live room with a production desk inside. And this is becoming very common. We have a lot of uh, new uh, projects going on everywhere in the world that people want to be inside of the session with the musicians. Control room has uh, large Augsburger speakers with uh, dual 18 subwoofers uh, right under them on both sides, two subs. So a lot of pressure in this room. First measurement that we took, uh, had the pleasure to do this with Derek also, once again. And this is a three-way system. When you look at this curve, you may, you may get scared in the beginning, but of course you can control the levels of uh, each one of the, of the crossovers uh, of the ranges. So, you know, immediately you can, you can get a very good starting point for, for processing the system. And again, here we see the prediction and we're gonna focus on those cancellation areas. And uh, what you see in green is the actual measurement that we did in the room. So, you know, we, we were very fortunate to be able to control those, those cancellations by adding quite a lot of absorption in the room. Uh, for example, at 42 Hertz, we had, you know, platforms at the front and the back with Helmholtz resonators. And as we go to 65 Hertz, another issue that we had, 
we covered that with uh, pressure absorbers above the, uh, the speaker wall at the front corner. And here we see uh, two decay curves. Uh, they're just two different measurement points. Uh, one is in the back, as you see as receiver one and receiver two at the mix position. They are pretty similar. We were just uh, comparing to make sure we got uh, useful data so we can learn from what we have designed. And if you look close, uh, think about, for example, 30 Hertz. We're talking about, you know, 250 milliseconds on a 30 dB drop, which is pretty short. Even 23 Hertz, which we don't have that much energy from the system, it's also pretty short, around 400 milliseconds. So again, very tight base and uh, it can be better than this, you know, we're very, for hip hop guys, such as this client, they're super happy because they, they can crank it up without any issues in the low frequency domain. And what you look, what you're looking now is the frequency response of both systems, the mains, the Augsburgers, the big ones, and the focals, which are the midfields. And you can see that they're pretty similar in terms of, of what we came up in the end after listening with the client, which brings us to this uh, study that Sean Olive did a few years ago. He put a lot of golden ear people listening to music with different uh, EQ setups in the system. And not a surprise, but this is the kind of curve that most people like to hear. And if you look at the rooms that we were talking about after the tuning sessions that we did, you're gonna see that they all talk to this curve. And that's really how people like. And the only way to get there is by using some kind of processing in, in, a, in a tuning session. So we as a company, we believe that this is a very critical step to do in every project. And we try to, to make it part of our scope of work just because we believe that that's, that's the way you're gonna get a very good sounding room to a level of excellence. That's a, that's an interesting point, Renato, because a few people are asking, do you, do you always do final tuning? And, and right. um, everything we've been talking about are tools. There's no one tool to build a house. You need an assortment of tools and tuning mm -hmm. is definitely a tool. Yeah. 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 It's the, uh, like Dirk always says, is the, is the icing on the cake, right? I think you have so, one more. Yeah. Great. Yeah, this is the last slide. I just want to mention this because, you know, we've been looking at uh, uh, recommendations such as the ITU limits for control rooms. For example, you're looking at one measurement from, from one of our rooms, but nobody's really talking about what's happening, you know, below 125 Hertz. And that's exactly what we've been putting a lot of effort. Peter and his team are studying this in, in, in depth. And uh, our goal is to try different curves. You know, so far, you know, after doing this for over 20 years, I haven't seen a room that doesn't mm -hmm. follow this trend to go up, to rise a little bit at the low end. Yeah. I've never seen a room that goes flat and I've never seen a room that goes down in frequency in, in, in level here, but I'm looking forward to see that. And uh, so we can uh, learn from that. From that. And I'm sure we're going to see ourselves talking more about T30 than T60, especially for control rooms in the future. Great. So I guess that's uh, that's it for today. Hope you guys have enjoyed. Thank you. So let's bring back everyone to the call. Well, thank you very, thank you very much, uh, uh, Renato. For some reason, my video has died. I'm not sure. Maybe. I guess it's just because I'm old, but luckily we still have Peter and 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 uh, and uh, uh, Dirk and 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 Renato. Um, I guess we still have some work to do. I thank you very much, everybody, for the polls. The last two polls were very encouraging. <laughs> the question about vibe and the question about what's most important in studios. I don't know. Maybe Justin can send up shoot up those results. Um, <laughs> These two polls, well, mm -hmm. it looks like we still have work. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. We've spent all of our life, I've spent 51 years 
basically believing that architecture, technology, and uh, acoustics are a dance. It's a three-way dance. One is not painted on the other. They're all important. And um, over the last 15 years, our recording environments have gotten smaller. I think everybody will agree with that. And hopefully at the end of today, everybody begins to realize that small rooms are actually not that easy. In fact, small rooms are harder to uh, deal and handle with low frequencies because of that pesty Schroeder frequency, which probably nobody paid attention to. But um, <clears throat> anyway, it's been an honor to, to host this and um, 250 out of 300 people stayed on for the hour and a half, did not leave when the math came on. Well, maybe they did, we just didn't know. Um, we tried to answer as many questions as possible. Every question has been digested and um, I'm gonna end my job, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Justin, who will put his video on and basically give some final goodbyes. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Renato. Thank you. Justin. Thank you, attendants. Thanks for yes. hanging in there with us. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, everyone. That was really terrific. Um, so many questions. I will uh, just remind everyone that we will be following up on all those questions. The, vi the entire video of today's session will be available on our website and, and on our YouTube channel. And stay tuned, we'll be doing more of these coming in the future. Um, we're seeing a tremendous response from the community. Um, I wanna just thank everyone. Peter, thank you so much for getting your screen share working. John, too bad. Um, actually, what John didn't mention is he's testing a new Zoom virtual background called Blackout for Big Data. <laughs> and uh, it's working. Available, and it's working really, really well. So yeah, it blacks out uh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, I thank you all for attending. Thanks for staying on, even though we went over time a little bit. Um, we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot. Cool. Good job, guys. Thanks. <laughs>